Friday evening, last session. I know it's low energy, but hey, let's go. Um, how to ship fast without regrets? It's a big question. Um, my goal here is to give you one idea, right? one of the learnings that we've had from our customers uh, over the years at Metaplay. But before we get there, let's just start with who am I? Because there's a lot of new faces in the audience. Um, and essentially, just a little bit on this, uh, we're going to go through it fairly fast, but um, my topic is technology today. So we're going to talk about startups making a game and some, some of the non-obvious things that the choices you might do in the beginning that are going to hurt you towards the end. Um, and maybe we'll come up with some stories from there, and maybe we'll hopefully even find a couple of life hacks and takeaways for you to, to take home. But myself, Teemu Haila, well met. Um, I hail from a company called Metaplay here in Helsinki. Uh, I'm the co-founder and uh, chief product officer. Uh, I've, I've made games before, so I've been a game lead at uh, my own company called Playraven. It was acquired by Rovio in uh, 2018, and I was also a game lead at Vuga in um, Berlin. I've been in the, in the game scene here for maybe 15 years-ish. Uh, some of the games I've worked on, IPs like the EVE Online games with CCP, um, arcade titles with Vuga, all that. It's mobile free-to-play is my, my wheelhouse. Uh, got a um, lifetime achievement for my GDA Finland some years back. So, you know, that. Um, and all of that is somewhat related. So games and the community actually came together with our current company, Metaplay, where we do backend technology for mobile free play games. So instead of making games, we finally figured out ah, th the world <laughs> is missing some of the tools that you need to make games well. Like we, we just... We always had to build this stuff ourselves. So now, instead of making games, we are making the tools we think the world is missing. <laughs> you know, the next games company that I'm going to found, we're going to use the stuff that we do today to save a lot of time and money. But, but some of the customers that we're working with, are, for example, you know, Merge Mansion by Metacore, it's one of the bigger hit games to come out of Finland in the recent years. Uh, so very sort of proud to work with these guys, for example, on, on their biggest title. But let's... So to set the scene a little bit, new startup, making a game. Me, after um, selling off Playrave and thinking about some, founding a new studio, I want to make a hit title that's played by hundreds of millions of players. What does that even look like from a sort of company founder point of view, right? Like what, what are we aiming for so that we know what we need to build? Well, you can obviously look at the top charts. Uh, and while there's a, a lot of different titles here, with a lot of different kinds of mechanics and themes and all that. But if you're going to step away a little bit and squint, they all start to look roughly similar, right? Like we can come up with a spec based on this. First of all, they're all free to play. They're all played by these massive audiences. And when you make a game that has something like this, or on this scale, you have so two major parts of it. First of all, they're all very highly retaining meaning players played for a very long time. And there's a couple of main drivers behind that. They're generally all social. They are these living worlds where that keep on evolving year after year that keep, keep themselves fresh, right? That it's worth coming back to. Um, and they are what's sometimes called a content bonfire. There's just an amazing amount of stuff to do all the time. And US developers are like feeding the beast all the time, bringing in new storylines and assets and events and, and all that, right? Like that's, that's kind of one of the cornerstones of what makes something highly retaining. While you have that, you also need to make money out of it, turns out. So these games generally have a very high lifetime value as well. And that comes in from things like that the, the game itself is cheat proof, meaning that if you can buy something in the game, you can't easily just like press a button and duplicate an item. That things in the game have value and they're worth the money that people are spending on it, for example. They generally have things like the, the shopkeeping experience. If you're going into the game and buying something, it's, it's fun, right? Like the, the shops are part of what makes the game fun. And the same way in, here in Helsinki, you go to Stockholm and it's kind of a... Um, full-on festival of consumerism, right? Like, it's not just a, a button somewhere. And also, the games tend to be... Um, they have a very personal relationship with you, especially if you're spending money. Like, if you have a problem, you can reach out to a human, and a human will answer you if you have a problem in the game. Or the games some might adapt themselves to you, etc., etc. So, there are these some major elements that we need to build if me... if I want to now start to make a new top-crossing game 
And all right, so let's think about like what do I need to, what kind of things do I need to build to roughly address this sort of spec? Well, and by the way, it really is just a starting point. There's way more to this. But let's think of the spec. So some kind of MVP shopping list of things we need to build. So we obviously need some kind of online persistence and ways to connect to the game, so social logins. We probably need to run our game logic on a server so to make it cheat proof. Okay. Uh, we probably need some place or some way to run this multiplayer or social gameplay logic because obviously, you know, they, a lot of stuff can happen in the game even though the game, you, you don't have it open. So there's some kind of simulation in the cloud or something, something. Uh, we need to be able to, because of the content bonfire and stuff, we need to be able to over the air update how the game looks and feels like, whether that's localization, or so game configs or upload new assets to it, because making builds is way too slow. We need to have some kind of tooling set up to uh, do the customer support. So for non-technical hundreds of people uh, working on 14 different languages, be able to answer tickets from players in a timely way, donate resources, whatever, right? Something like that needs to be built. Uh, and generally, then this whole umbrella of what's called live ops nowadays of tools um, to essentially schedule events and target offers and, and so on. Okay, that's a lot. So technically speaking, if that was sort of them with the product guy coming, talking with them or the designer, and now the designer is talking with them or the programmer saying, right, what do I need to actually make to build something like that? Very briefly, we probably need a game client, and that game client needs to connect to something that can handle hundreds of millions of players. So let's talk about load balancing and so on. And that probably connects to a server that handles the game logic, which probably then talks to the multiplayer game logic, which is a slightly different thing. All of that probably shares some kind of uh, data, like the game configuration that will be downloaded both by the client uh, and you know, the server, like game balancing is synchronized between all of these. And all of those are probably talking to an external ser service, like an umbrella of services to send notifications and do in-app purchases and so on. You probably want to persist all of this, so that implies databases in a scalable way. And let's just like call that a game server, right? And then you probably want to make this whole thing horizontally and vertically scalable to handle a lot of players. But that's not it, because we also needed to build the things that actually manage all of that. So to, to deploy new versions of a game, you need to have this tooling to manage the cluster itself, and nobody does that manually. So really, you need the automated tools to actually do that for you. Um, and then you need to know what's going on with it. So we need to have tools to actually so see what the performance of these servers are. We need to be able to uh, figure out what kind of problems are happening, so I'll collect logs from the servers. And we probably need analytics from this system to know if the game is any good. And then suddenly designers are also interested in that. Oh, and by the way, there was the live ops thing, so we need dashboards which are talking to the game servers. And now we're starting to you know, talk about what an infrastructure might look like for a game like this as a starting point, <laughs> based on the spec that we were just discussing, right? Uh, and that's before we're talking about things like legal compliance or backups or how to make the thing hack-proof and so on and so forth. There's a lot. And at this point, um, for more technical people in the audience, all of this might kind of flow fairly quickly. To others, it might just be like, holy crap, what's going on? And I I'm with you guys, the latter group, <laughs> because as a startup person, that that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to make a game company that's making cool games that are worth playing. So let's put all of that aside and start again, but more from a, what are we actually doing as a startup? Well, as we know, just saying, random look around Helsinki, some of the bigger kind of logos in games company windows, all of them started from a very small team. Like what I just showed, that was a lot to do. And we don't have like 25 people day one working on this. So what do you do when you're starting with five people or seven people? Well, at that point, the plan is something like this. Step one, let's make a small game that we can actually make with few people. Once we have that, let's get some eyeballs on that and figure out if it's, if it's worth it, right? Like if people love it and if it's worth investing more. Once we have those numbers, let's show those numbers to somebody who's got money and then get the millions that we need to actually make a bigger version of that same game. Then actually, 
do the game. <laughs> like something will happen here. Uh, then that already takes two or three years, so we're not quite sure where it's going to take us. But you know, that sounds like a good plan. Let's go. And while this is highly reductive and simplified, I also think it's roughly accurate. Right? This is how startups think <laughs> in Finland, and it's a good way of going about it. Let's just solve the first problems, prove that it's worth doing, and then solve the real problems a little bit later once we're better equipped and we're like well funded to actually you know, fi fix these problems. So let's do the same exercise with this idea in mind. Our goal is to get a hit game that's worth investing in. And again, that roughly means that we as a designer, we want to get to the data, which means we need to build at least the very core of the game, the core loops and basic gameplays. We need to be able to put that into soft launch for real players to play in a real environment, to get the players on it, to get the data. And to get the data, we actually need to introduce some analytics tools. But that's roughly what we need to get an idea if it's worth doing. And since we don't really have a lot of money or resources, we really need to do this very quick and very cheap. Because we have, generally, companies only have like a top half a million at most uh, to do something like this. And really, more like a couple of hundreds of thousands, which is not a lot of salary end of the day. So you're probably really focusing on values like, OK, we need to be able to develop this offline in editor as quick as possible to get, keep our speeds up. We need to really cut down on all the things that we want to do and focus on these very core gameplay pieces, focus on getting the minimum viable technologies in place just to you know, throw this out as fast as possible. And to do that, we are also going to use as familiar tech as possible so that we can kind of avoid the obvious pitfalls, et cetera, et cetera. So these are kind of the values that we are now interested in. All right. Again, from business person to designer, what are we then, what's our shopping list of stuff and what kind of choices are we able to make from this kind of life hacky standpoint? All right. We're going to be developing in editor as much as possible, not making device builds all the time because that's slow. Uh, we are probably going to fake most of our multiplayer are like really only just kind of make it work really rather let's make offline gameplay because that's so much faster you don't need to have multiple players online at the same time so it makes testing a lot easier all that we do need to put in those purchases and we do need to put in the analytics pipeline because otherwise we don't have data so that's a little bit boring but can't avoid it um, but we can do really interesting things like we could even reset the whole game if we wanted to because only a couple of thousand people have ever seen it. At this point, it's a test launch, so it doesn't need a lot of like stability and redundance. Uh, and really, we just want to avoid almost any extra effort if at all possible. And those are kind of our values from a startup point of view. Right. So same question as before. The tech person now comes into the room and says, I understand this spec and this reasoning. So what do I need to build to make this possible for you? Well, not much, right? It probably looks something like this. So we have, we have players. They need to be able to run the logic somewhere just enough to be able to connect to those analytics, et cetera, services uh, to do the payments. We do need a database. Um, and then just enough tooling to you know, read the analytics and Bob's your uncle. And that's not too bad, right? Like as a, as a person who's done something like this before, I can imagine at least 12 different ways of building this from off-the-shelf components. Uh, give me a couple of weeks and we'll have a prototype going. So sounds good. Let's go. Um, and that's obviously where we're going to step on our first landmine of the day, <laughs> where the simple solution here looks very, very, very different from the bigger solution. And you know, if we don't take that into account, we're going to end up in problems. So let's just kind of stop and observe this one thing, right? This is now at the very core. What we want to do as a small team or as a young startup, the things we need and the things that we value are very different than the things that we actually need and value when we are in the top 10 grossing segment. Here's a mismatch, and we need to solve this somehow. So let's talk about that. Um, let, let's, let's like, for example, let's divide this whole thing into three stages of a company. And let me just dodge a little bit for the slides. Um, let's say the startup and the scale up and the unicorn. Eh, feel free to use other names for these stages. But when we are a startup, 
again, the same things. We, we want to work fast in like offline environments. We do need analytics. Everything needs to be super cheap because we don't have that money. And we'd love it if, if this was as managed as possible, which just means that somebody else is taking care of the infrastructure, that we don't need to have a Mac mini under the bed to run the game. Like that's, even that's too much. And that's what we kind of care about in the beginning. Uh, and that's, that's a technical side. And then from an artist point of view, we also would love to just have everything pre-made for us, like integrate off the shelf payments, yields, whatever you need in the game. Uh, because we don't have, really have the time or motivation to start to build all of this from scratch. Okay, that's the starting point. But then the moment you go from, say, five people in a team that's trying to find a, a game worth investing in, let's say you find it, and now you're starting to raise multiple millions, tens of millions to scale your game, you're, you're hiring tenfold, so you're going from five people to 50 people as a team, you have a game with millions and tens of millions of players, suddenly you clearly have more requirements that you start to care about. So, for example, if before, it really didn't matter if the game is cheat-proof or not, right? Because we just want to get an idea. Suddenly, now, we need to have it. Because otherwise, the economy is not going to scale, and we're not going to be able to monetize the game like, in, a, in a big way. The game itself needs to scale to those tens of millions of players previously. It didn't. Uh, we need to suddenly have multiples of the game running, because one for development, one for QA people, one for production, maybe even more. Um, and we need to start to do this whole DevOps situation, which is about managing the live environments and all that. So new requirements just popped up. But then even more happens on the creative side, where now suddenly we need to have those live ops tools and we need to really... Um, if I, if I kind of put it on, on one big bullet point, we need to have feature parity with the rest of the top 100 games, right? Because it's a, because of the auction house situation in, in um, user acquisition, we need to essentially be able to make more money than the games that we're directly competing against to be able to pay for the ads, to be able to get people to know that our game exists. It's kind of an unfortunate loop, but that's what it is. So to get there, we generally need to have a certain amount of quality that is good good enough compared to the other games. We need to be able to offer the same level of customer support, run as kind of interesting and engaging seasonal events, or they will rather play the other games' seasonal events, and so on. So we suddenly enter this arms race of, yep, let's, let's get to the same features as the others. And at this point, it's just absolutely mandatory to iterate on your game over the air. You need to have some localization because not everybody speaks English in the whole world, etc., etc., etc. So all of these things are now something you need to build on top of the game that you already made. But you're at the same time kind of losing some of the requirements. For example, no longer it doesn't have to be cheap because you're making money. So. In a way, you can let go of some of the assumptions that you had earlier. And then, let's say that we, we're not only in this sort of scale-up phase of tens of millions of players, but now the game is going to be a mega hit, and we're aiming for the actual top crossing, and we're going to have hundreds of millions of players, maybe over a billion installs, like some of the biggest games have. And suddenly you get this explosion of technology requirements that you didn't have before. So, for example, legal compliance is a thing <laughs> on these scales. You really want to do things like start to integrate your in-house analytics stacks or like deeply customize how the game works. Essentially, you, you just need to, need to make something that is so durable, so well maintainable for tens of years that that is the cornerstone of your business. While, again, in the beginning, it didn't matter at all. And we can kind of even throw away some of this stuff that we cared about before because from a creative point of view, this is interesting to me. If somewhere in the middle you were going for feature parity as a game designer, I want roughly the same features or as good features as we had before, not anymore. You already have all of that. There's nothing else to copy anymore because you are in the top 10. So now you're truly inventing new stuff that didn't exist before, coming up with new kinds of game features. So you need to be able to sort of take the game to a place where no game has ever gone before <laughs> from a creative standpoint. So that's a very, very kind of interesting um, requirement. So if I kind of look at this big picture, sure, in the very beginning, I could look at this as a technology guy and go, 
right, let's build this. <laughs> Let, let's build something that can uh, satisfy all of these requirements. But that would be utter madness because that takes years, right? So the real shipper's remorse, and this is my one sort of idea for the day, is that the biggest way to regret shipping a game is to ship it from a technology point of view by only having those initial requirements at hand and not necessarily planning how you're going to grow and adopt new sort of technologies or new, uh, new features to your tech and be able to deprecate some of the old requirements. How, how is it going to evolve and live with the game? And that is an interesting question that not a lot of people are talking about. Uh, if you are in this unfortunate case, you might notice it from symptoms like uh, yes, your, your game designers are dreaming up, with, uh, dreaming up amazing new features, but then the product guys are kind of answering, like, that sounds amazing, but could you please design something else that's maybe a little bit easier to implement because we don't have a lot of time and it takes forever to do, so could you come up with like an easier idea, please? That's a very common discussion to have. Or the tech, that tech stack itself, you can't really build on top of it anymore, so you start to build around it, so you have this like a web of microservices that talk to each other and suddenly nobody has any idea what's going on anymore. When there's a bug, it's almost impossible to debug, et cetera, et cetera. Or just in general, your team ends up spending a lot of time maintaining these old systems that you've built because they don't really, like, they don't expand on the design sense. Like our leaderboards don't allow the kinds of leaderboards we want to do. So now we have to, I don't know, build new ones and then we have the old ones at the same time and like what's going on. These are just some kind of symptoms of, you know, that are caused by this sort of thinking. And, and really, I love this quote again, Matthias Müller from Red Hill, who we're also here today. He likes to say, hope is not a plan, and it applies here as well. <laughs> so saying that, yes, we are going to find that game that's worth investing in. Yes, we're going to raise a lot of money, and yes, we're going to hire a big team, and then hope that they can figure this technical thing out somehow later. No. <laughs> and... My, my argument to you today is that it is literally a hundred times better to spend two days now thinking about how are we going to solve this uh, than spending the same amount of like hundreds of days, multiple years, uh, not years, but months of time refactoring those same systems later just because we didn't, you know, it felt complicated at the time. So one way to kind of, I need to check against this. Now, if we have a little bit of buy-in on this problem, Consider this, could you, right now, um, one of the features that you need to do, if you just ask yourself, without doing the feature now, let's talk about guilds, without doing guilds right now, could I adopt guilds later without fundamentally refactoring how we've made our game? Or complement this with any feature you think you might want to have in the future. Can you do it without fundamentally refactoring your whole, how, the way the game is built? The answer is yes, amazing. Don't do the feature now, just focus on your MVP as you should, and let's go. But if the answer is no, well, then I would really say maybe you should go and refactor just that bit, but not actually do the guilds yet. Just do enough changes that you know you will be comfortably able to make guilds later, but not actually do the work yet, and again, focus on the MVP. So it's about being prepared on all the things you need to do without actually going off and doing them yet, because you don't have time for that. And let me give you a concrete example of what we've heard from our customers of what is the single biggest kind of return of investment of the, let's call it a life hack of what's worth doing in the beginning because it gives you so much kind of benefit later on. And that's game, game configs. And when I say game configs, I mean how do you modify the game's balance remotely without updating the game's build. And here's the default way of updating game configs, right? That's you just hard code stuff. <laughs> you don't do anything which is lovely. You just edit some code, change the values in the game, how it works, make a new build, test it on device, and you know that's how builds are made. And this is brilliant because it requires no thought or initial setup or extra work. You just do it and you're done, right? I love that. But it's got some very obvious downsides. First one being that device builds are very slow to make, very slow to distribute. So if you want to change something, I don't change, test, change, test. That's going to take forever. Nobody wants to do that at scale. It's actually quite difficult for non-programmers, non obviously. So like, no, no good programmer wants designers monkeying with their code on this level. It's not a thing you do at scale. 
And overall, this type of a workflow doesn't scale for bigger teams. And when I say bigger teams, I meant 50, 100, so on. So it is an actual dead end. We cannot do this at scale. So while lovely idea has problems, so we need to do something about it. And the most common solution that I see on the field is you know, the classic, let's take the configuration file, put it in the internet and download it on the phone. And then ta -da, we can update the file and we can um, see values change on the, on the build without actually making a new build. And, and usually this is something like you know, JSON files in AWS, which is fantastic in many ways, first of all, because it's simple to do, even though it involves you know, the internet. The technologies and tools are very well established from the 90s. Almost everybody knows how to do this. It takes half an hour. Uh, the, the data formats themselves, very easy to generate, very easy to parse. So there's not a lot of like, effort related to here. But again, there's some potentially non-obvious downsides that make this a really bad idea. And generally, people migrate away from something like this at some point during the project. First of all, I don't know if you knew, but JSON files are very slow <laughs> to uh, parse um, at scale. So literally to the point where we're seeing uh, in our customer games that if you have a very, very, very large economy in a game, then you don't try to download that to an older Android phone, it takes 29.90 seconds to try to parse out what your game config is, then it times out and crashes and the players can't actually play the game anymore because they can't open the config file of the game <laughs> on start. Not a good experience. Um, again, some of these, these data formats, they are still actually quite difficult for um, non-technical people to work with. Uh, and it still doesn't answer our advanced questions about versioning and rollbacks and A-B testing and all the stuff that we actually don't want now, but we want them later. So it's a dead end strategy. And I hate that. Like what we're doing some amount of effort to set something up, but it's not a solution that takes us all the way and it doesn't have an obvious migration path. So what the hell? Um, and here's an example of what we do at Metaplay or what our customers do is to say, hey, let's solve the slow technical problem by making an efficient binary format. Let's make our own kind of histories and so on to manage the versioning and rollout and, and all that. Um, so then developers use whatever tool they want to use, usually spreadsheets like Google Sheets. Then that gets digested, it makes a build, and those builds are rolled out to the devices. Okay. It's really good as a high-level workflow because you can use whatever tools you want. It allows for versioning and rollouts and, and all that, which is about accommodating very large teams on the biggest possible scale. Excellent. It's very high performance, fast to build, fast to parse on a device. Excellent. And more to the point, if you have something like this, which implicitly has a build step, then you can customize that build step and say, right, we can change the editors, we can change the data formats, we can change how this stuff works as our game grows. Excellent. But it has a massive downside. It's a lot to set up, right? Like now we're talking about having cloud deployments and we're talking about having a build step in the first place in configs and all that. And that's too much, right? Like that's what I was talking about earlier. We shouldn't build all this stuff up front, even though we know we need it at some point. So what's a girl to do? Here's the life hack part. What if we consider all of these build steps and not actually do them, but essentially implement the minimums on our editor, on the client, to be able to parse these binary files, to be able to declare them, but not actually upload them to the internet, not have this whole over there set up, but essentially just have the minimal bare bones to say, this is what it would look like, but instead of actually doing all of it, we're simply gonna hard code the values, make builds, test it like we wanted to in the beginning. But then when at some point we know that we need to migrate away from this, then we already know what the solution is gonna look like and we can do it when we want later, right? And my sort of underlying message here, which sometimes is a little bit surprising, is that doing stuff that's future-proof, that's worth doing, that can carry over these massive games, it's not necessarily slow. It doesn't take a lot of time. It just takes thinking about it in the beginning. And specifically, convicts are just the highest return of investment thing you'd possibly do. Please do it. <laughs> no excuses. This will make you a lot faster. Um, 
and of course, the higher, higher point here is that we all know habits are hard to change. Once you have a system, you want to stick with the system. But in the beginning, you might as well just set up something that you learn how to use over time. And then, you know, you can take it more complicated towards the end. So let's, let's establish good habits in the beginning. And just as a sort of takeaway, here's some of the things. If game config is one example, here's some other things that are very, 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 very good to consider early and then implement later. So game configs, then it's how are you going to run your cheat proof game logic. That's a massive pain to refactor later on. Uh, it's the whole customer support tools. How are you going to implement it? Let's just talk about that for a couple of minutes. Uh, how are you go exactly going to do your legal compliance? Because, you know, it's the law. So we have to figure it out somehow. Backups, GDPR, so on. It's not difficult. Let's just talk about it a couple of minutes. How are you going to localize? Because all programmers who've done localization know that you don't hard code strings in your, in your UI. You want to have a layer of abstraction there. Again, let's just like consider that for a couple of minutes. And there's more, but that's already kind of enough. And as a parting thought, Consider this, do you actually enjoy <laughs> solving problems like this? If yes, fantastic, we are hiring, you should talk to me. And if you don't, well, maybe we can help you out. That's what we do at Metaplay, right? <laughs> so, um, again, my one takeaway from this is making really big games is a lot of fun, but there's a couple of gotchas, so let's talk about them. And I'm here if you want to you know, chat about that afterwards. That's also my email, demhoyla at metaplay.io. Don't be a stranger. So thanks for your attention. And uh, I think I was the last talker. So, so thanks for showing up <laughs> for the conference. And I think we have some, a little bit of time maybe for QA and then some closing no, words. No, Demo, I'm going to, you're not the last one. We have something um, happening after. So Perfect. you were not, the, yeah, yeah. So, right. uh, but um, I'd recommend uh, if you have the questions, Demo, if you can stay. Absolutely. The guys have the, um, the standard here as well. And uh, we need to move on because we are a little bit late with the art um, winners. Thank Let's you, Demo. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys.